Welcome to this edition of Great Books, a lively discussion of a selection from the canon of exceptional literature. Here's your host, Jack Hatfield. Welcome. Thanks for joining us for the Great Book Show. I'm Jack Hatfield. Our panel meets periodically to discuss great works of classic and modern literature. Maureen will introduce our selection for today from Letters to a Young Poet by Renair Maria Wilkie. Maureen? Rainer Maria Rilke was born in 1875 in Prague, which was then part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. He was unhappy as a child, describing the years he spent in the military academy as a primer of horror. By the time he entered Charles University, he had already published his first book of poetry. Married to the sculptress Clara Westhoff, but later separated, Rilke lived throughout Europe, but primarily in Paris, where he at one time worked as secretary to the sculptor Rodin and had a mistress trained in psychoanalysis by Sigmund Freud. Writing in both French and German, Rilke became known for his elegant language, which reached out to engage the reader morally and emotionally. Born Catholic, his Book of Hours dealt with man's search for God, while his existential semi-autobiographical novel described the disintegration of a soul. After a 10-year dry spell, in 1923, his highly praised Sonnets to Orpheus and Duino Elegies laid out what some consider a new way of looking at life, a new myth of modern man. Early thoughts on these topics are covered in a series of 10 letters written from 1902 to 1908 to Franz Xavier Kappas, a student at Rilke's former military academy. Refusing a request to critique Kappas's poems, Rilke instead gave advice on finding one's own voice as a poet, on dealing with solitude and difficulty, on having relationships with women, and on finding one's destiny. Three years after Rilke died of leukemia in 1926, Kappas published the letters. Let's see what advice we might glean for ourselves as we explore Rilke's Letters to a Young Poet. Jack? Uh, Rilke spends a lot of time talking about solitude and love. And my first question is going to, we can discuss solitude a little bit and then love a little bit and how do they fit together and seem antagonistic to one another. Just to read you something that he says about solitude. What is necessary after all is only this, solitude, vast inner solitude, to walk inside yourself and meet no one for hours, to be solitary as you were when you were a child, when the grown-ups walked around involved with matters that seemed large and important because they looked so busy and because you didn't understand a thing about what they were doing. Can you say anything more about, about uh, solitude and how it fits into his, his um, advice on both uh, creativity and life? Well, he, he started out by saying solitude is the basis of everything. Everybody has the solitude at the base. And if you try to escape it, it's not possible. So you need to embrace it and realize that even if it's difficult, even if you want to run away from it, in order to grow, you need to work through that solitude and figure out who you are and your ideas and what your ideas are without looking for other people's approval. Well, solitude is, is, uh, is important and it's basic, but people can escape solitude and uh, preoccupy themselves <clears throat> with things that aren't character building, and then they're not ready for love. But then they're not ready. Right. But, and so and solitude so uh, brings you self-knowledge, and then you can become a more emotionally mature and ready for love. Yeah. You're finding yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you become more centered uh, when, you, uh, when you use solitude as a way to discover yourself. But he doesn't say to leave solitude behind, right? Right, because that's really impossible. You can't, as, as Martin was saying, you can't really leave it behind. But, um, but I think that's, yeah, that was the, the comment I was gonna make, Bob's comment, that, that the basis of everything is solitude because that's how you form yourself. You have to basically cut yourself off from conventional solutions, from other people's ideas of what 
of what your life should be. And the only way to really do that is to go inside yourself. And that's where the love, I think, comes in. And he contrasts it in this letter that you were, uh, that you were uh, talking about, that the, um, uh, with, with young people who rush into it when they're only half formed, right. essentially, and they throw themselves together. He says something like, uh, um, they fling themselves at each other when, when love takes hold. And what can life, just as they are in all their messiness, disorder, bewilderment, and what can happen then? What can life do with this heap of half-broken things that they call their communion? Um, it, they're, they're hardly even formed as people. Doesn't he say young people can't love because yes. they, they just don't have a, a life experience? Right. He says and they can't, you and have to learn it. Yeah. You right. have to learn it. Right. And then he says, but learning time is always a long secluded <laughs> time. And so loving for a long while ahead and far on into life is solitude. Right. Intensified and deep in loneliness for him who loves. So. After you fall in love, he says, well, you're going to even get deeper into solitude, right? And that's good. It's an unending process, yeah. uh, self-knowledge through solitude, so that uh, you can uh, learn more how to love by knowing yourself, even in your emotional maturity. You always need solitude. It, what I liked also, that what he said was after you fall in love, okay, you're in the solitude, then you fall in love, and you think you're getting out of it, but you're not. He says love is a high inducement to the individual to ripen, right? It's a claim upon him, something that calls, that chooses him out and calls him to vast things. And I just love that quote, that, okay, now that you're in love with somebody, well, you're going to become more than you would have been if you hadn't fallen in love with someone. But still, it's something you have to work through by yourself. And in solitude, I, I think he's also saying, uh, I think someone mentioned it somewhat like this earlier, you have to get rid of all your conditioning and all your hang-ups and just kind of be bare to the world and bare to other people. And he's saying that that's kind of the start of the creative process and very important. And I was looking for the quote here and I don't see it, he's, he says, Things are important. Um, it could be a flower, it could be a, a pencil, it could be anything. It's just to be open to even the mundane that's out there. And his, my favorite quote of all, which is, uh, uh, well, go ahead and let me find it. Uh, oh. Technology. Yeah, he, often, <laughs> he, often does, um, he often does talk about things, and then he capitalizes, at least in my translation, he capitalizes the word things yes. as, if, as if out of all of the things of this world, there are, there's this subset of things. And I'm not, I'm not sure I really understood how that subset was different from all the other things of this world. Does any, did anybody? It's not different. It's not different. No, it's because he, he's really saying thing. everything's a thing, and it's so important to meet that in its thingness, if that makes sense, as opposed to, you know, we see uh, a camera or something, and we think all the the crud we add onto it. You know, I remember a camera it took, uh, and you know, and all this sort of well, stuff. Know and experience everything yourself and deeply, and internalize it, and that adds to your arsenal of self-knowledge or, or solitude. I think solitude is, is, a, simil, uh, is a synonym for self-knowledge. Mm. And so if you understand things, sorrow is one of the ingredients of solitude. That you have to embrace sorrow because you can understand it and learn from it. And that's one of the ingredients to your emotional maturity. It makes you capable of love. I'd say, I don't disagree with you, I would use the word openness. Mm -hmm. is the same as solitude, is that openness to something. Here's my favorite quote of all, and I've heard this in so many different uh, contexts. If your everyday life seems poor, mm. don't blame it, blame yourself. Admit to yourself that you are not enough of a poet to call forth its riches. Because for the Creator, there's not poverty and no poor in different place. And it kind of fits into a lot of different things, including what we're talking about, is those things, even the very mundane, you know, you find a quarter and lying in the ground, and that can be a source of, of uh, a lot of very positive emotions. And he goes on and on again about how um, you shouldn't look to what other people say. And being as 
these letters started with Kappas sending a letter with a poem in it to Rilke and asking, what do you think of my poem? And Rilke said, you shouldn't care what other people think. Mm -hmm. You have to look within yourself. <laughs> he said, that's exactly what he said. Go into yourself. Mm -hmm. That's the advice he gives him in the first letter. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I wonder if he's just talking to the poet. You think he's preaching life to everyone? I think so. Are you, are you, huh? Well, it's been I, taken as that for a hundred years, but it, it made me wonder if he wrote this with a mind yeah, yeah, well, right. for their publication. They well, were private letters mm -hmm. that were, right. were published by Over the time. recipient right. after Rilke had died. Mm -hmm. He also makes it pretty clear that, that, the, that the people who can follow this advice are the elite. These, this is not really advice for everybody. He said, I think, in, that, in this, that same letter where he talks about love, he says, it's true that many young people who love falsely, that is simply surrendering themselves and their solitude, and he has in parenthesis, the average person will, of course, always go on doing that. His, his, his view of most people is that they can't rise to this, I don't think. I, I don't, and I don't think he's actually, um, I, don't, I don't think that this is a plea to expand the circle of heightened consciousness to, to people beyond the poetic circle. Yeah, I think you know, there's a point where he says, uh, you have to search for the reason why you write, and if the answer is, I must, and, and that's the only reason. That's the only reason. Yeah. If you don't have that, you, then you, you don't can. have a choice. Right. You must, you must write. write. And I, then you should that, write. I think that's probably true with most of the arts, and not true when it's not art. <laughs> so I don't think I woke up and said, I must be a salesperson. <laughs> <laughs> I always had that impression. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't I'm, 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 I'm disillusioned. <laughs> I, he, he might have written this to just an artist, but I think Dave was saying that uh, people have read it forever as opposed as, as something addressing people's lives, no matter what they're doing. Oh no, he, I don't. I don't, I don't disagree with that. I'm just saying that I don't think Rilke believes that. Right. Could be. yeah, but he said if you look at, into yourself and you find that you don't have to write, even asking yourself that question and, and examining yourself will make your life richer. And he, Not he, to be a writer. If yeah, you decide if you, not to be a writer, right, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, it's, it's still a good eventually. thing to go through mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah. And he what, said, what, uh, wasn't he in the military? He was in the some military. Point, like maybe the, the end, last letter or something. And he said, uh, that's a noble profession, too, yeah. Right? Yeah, if yeah, you do it for the right reason. And if you have time, you can also do your art, which he eventually did. He wrote screenplays. He was a journalist as well. He died in 1966. So he'd be around in our era to, you know, I'd like to look him up and see what he thought about this. I'd like to see what he wrote. Yeah. There, there's it's switching it to, to maybe a different lens looking at it and that's sadness which he talks about yeah. and how that fits in what we're talking about so far. And I just, he said the only sadness is that are dangerous and unhealthy are the ones that we carry around in public in order to drown them out with the noise. Like diseases, they're treated superficially and foolishly. They just withdraw and after a short interval break out again all the more terribly and gather inside us in our life our life that is unlived again it's that openness that that uh, uh, embracing sadness that he's talking about but he, he goes on about how sadness changes you it goes inside you and it changes you and you might not even realize it but your future is being written inside yourself by the sadnesses in your life so that years later when something comes out of you, yourself and you think, oh, well, that's just destiny. Well, it's destiny coming from within yourself that has been formed by mm -hmm. these years of solitude and the sadnesses that have changed you. It's, it's a, a pre thought, existential that was really idea. cool. Yeah. The thought I, I had was uh, the expression, you don't learn much about from your successes, it's your failures, failures. Yeah. that, you, that yeah, you learn good. from. Yeah. It's not your joys that you learn from, it's your sadnesses mm -hmm. that you learn from. That's the message I got out of it. Yes, yes. Yeah. I also got the sense, and this was, this is not anywhere in the letter, <clears throat> so I'm just curious how other people responded to that letter. I really got the sense he was really trying to comfort this guy. I mean, he was really yes. trying to, at, at some deep level, he didn't want, but he didn't want to do it in some kind of conventional way because that would be completely false to how to he himself. thinks about things. Right. But the, the very last 
paragraph I thought was interesting in that letter. He says, and if there is one more thing that I must say to you, it is this. Don't think that the person who is trying to comfort you now lives untroubled among the simple and quiet words that sometimes give you much pleasure. His life has much trouble and sadness and remains far behind yours. If it were otherwise, he would never have been able to find those words. Mm -hmm. And I thought that at some level he might have been talking about himself. I sure. some level, <clears throat> talk, at some level he might have been talking about himself, Self. although it's about himself. Yeah, mm -hmm. I thought, oh, I think yeah, he was. Thought definitely, so too. Definitely, yeah. 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 That I've experienced this self-knowledge and that's how I know that it helps. There was also part that intrigued me. When he talks about when you're in your childhood, okay, you pass out of your childhood and you look back on it. And sometimes if you put words to the experiences you had as a child, it could really affect you poorly. That sometimes it's just enough to know that you lived through it without looking back at it and putting words to it. It obfuscates your understanding. Yes. Well, he he often says, or often, several times, uh, at least in my translation, he talked about things basically being unsayable, and yes. uh, he said that right. in the very first letter that, yeah. that things are unsayable, mm -hmm. essentially. And I, I heard, and in your introduction, you talked about him being uh, associated with Luandria Salome, um, the, the the woman who was psychoanalyzed by Freud and became a psychoanalyst. Uh -huh. So she was very much, so he was very much into the idea of the uh, unconscious. Yes. And, uh, actually, she was the one who suggested that he change his first name from Rene to Rainier. Yes. Because <laughs> it was more masculine. You know, <laughs> in, in the fourth letter, <clears throat> he uses the man, Mr. Cap Capus. Capus, yeah. That's the first time he used his name. Did I miss? Oh, the my first? translation, it's, it's the in first? there several times. No, well, I think that was that, who at was a writing certain to point. Him. But he doesn't say that. The as, first as an three letters, he never mentions okay. his name in my translation. So, what do, what do you think the significance of that? I, 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 it's a question I have. Really? Is there any significance? I don't think so. But uh, when yeah. I write a letter, I normally don't put the person's name right. in it's it. Kind of they know who they are. <laughs> let, me, let me read something. He brings up fate. In kind of a way, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand. And he says, um, the smallest event unfolds like a fate, and fate itself is like a wonderful wide fabric in which every thread is guided by an infinitely tender hand and laid alongside another thread and is held and supported by a hundred other, others. Oh, that is a beautiful, it's beautiful, I'm not sure exactly. <laughs> That's what I said. Yeah, right. <laughs> He also says that <clears throat> life is always right. Whatever happens yeah, in life, you yeah. should just let life happen to you. Yeah. And whatever happens, it's always right. And uh, here's a quote. We have no reason to mistrust our world. I mean, I looked at this and I said, really? For it is not against us. Again, I went, really? <laughs> okay. Has its terrors, they are our terrors. Has it abysses, those abysses belong to us. Our dangers at hand, we must try to love them. So he's saying, don't be scared of life, right. that whatever's going to happen, it's going to be all good. You know, because if sadnesses yes. happen, those sadnesses are going to change you and going to make a future for yeah. you yeah. that is, is going to happen. And I think that ties into what I just read. Yeah. It, it also, so I think we're leading back yeah. to God, because he talks about mm -hmm. God a lot. Yeah. And, and, the, and, and the hand. The yeah. hand that holds up. Well, it, I wondered about so that because it wasn't, it wasn't just clear whether that was just metaphor or that was. But, but he also says in this where you shouldn't be afraid of life, you should have courage. And he says many people don't have courage. And in not having courage and being afraid, they've lost a lot of things. And he talks about the visions and the spirit world and ideas about death and God and relationships with people. In terms of people shy away from those ideas because they're afraid and mm -hmm. they don't have the courage, and, and we, that we, makes life a lot poorer. And we, yeah, we, we, we gain from it. Let, let me read something along that line. Mm. Perhaps all the dragons in our lives are princesses oh, right. who are only waiting to see us act just once with beauty and courage. Perhaps everything that frightens us is, in its deepest, deepest essence, something helpless that wants our love. Yeah. I just really yeah. need a way with words, he right? Sure does. <laughs> Don't you question the premise poet, yeah. that life is right? 
Don't you question that? I premise? question that yeah. premise, I but huh? he doesn't. I don't. Why not? Why not? It is. I mean, it just is. It just. What? Uh, what? Okay. That's why I mentioned God. Because okay. God is an is. There, there's an old saying that, that, and this is a metaphor, when the world ends and we all get up on the stage and take our bow, that we're celebrated for being what we really are. So the best person who turns out to be a thief, or it could be a hero or whatever, it's just we each has our, our life, and that turns out the way it is. And there's no way of, of right, rank ordering the, those there, no, there's in no terms of worthiness. Right. So, uh, so an altruist and a psychopath are basically, they're both, they're they're both the going to be they equal. Yeah. They're and natural. In a, in a way, I think you could say that everyone goes through lights trying to do the best they can. Right. Okay. Well, well, that's one interpretation of what he said. Maybe. I'm not so sure about that. I'm not so sure about that, yeah. but that's a whole different thing. Yeah. But if you look at it, the, the quote, believe me, life is right in any case, it could also mean, like, how can you argue with what happens? You can't say right. it didn't happen. Right. You right. know, yeah. but I think it, the choices you make certainly can be good or bad choices. And he talks yes. about when you, you're in love and if you just throw yourself at the other person instead of being ready for that love, then it, it's all going to fall apart and you're going to be forced to deal with it conventionally. And you really can't. There's no solution to either love or death. He you said know, that, yeah, he right. He says that also. The death too, yeah. yeah. But what I liked when he went on and he started talking about women, Yep. Right, and he's saying that women have to oh, change. Was... The relationship between women and men have to change. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know. I was know. against that, brother. They don't want. He wants them to be brothers and sisters. No, no. he <laughs> wanted the meeting together as two human beings, uh, and not a woman as being part of part a man. Of yeah. And I, yes. I took that. If it was an English translation as like woman is part of man, man. and that instead you have to look at yourself as you know, Person. completely feminine. And then he went on with all of man's frailties <laughs> and That's all okay. reasons so you, you, why you women okay. were... Sorry. <laughs> you can go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> we're all friends here. <laughs> I'm not going to quote the many things he said about men. <laughs> okay. But, you know, that women were, were strong and the, it, there was a goodness about women and a strength about yes. women that, that's completely separate from man. And only when things change between the sexes for which there's no model yet, because this was a long time ago, for which there's no model, then the sexes could come together in a, a new kind of love. I had and a sense that, I, I, I wondered about that, because I, I thought that, that sometimes, I think, I think Bob uh, alluded to it, sometimes he, when he talks about the sexes coming together like that, my sense was that he meant almost generic, that, 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 there's, that the, 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 the sexual, the things that are that sp that specifically differentiate men and women sexually fall away, and what you have is just humanness. Yeah, I didn't I didn't get a sense of exactly what that meant. But at other times, it sounded like it was more like uh, a growth on men's parts. You know, to that 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 the sometimes it seemed like it seemed like what what the ideal was was humanness that they come together in right. the humanness which is which yeah. is distinct from their male There's and their femaleness from, uh, and then other times it seemed like it was specifically male and femaleness yeah. he liked sex he talked about sex oh, he talked uh, about creativity uh, 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 being like sex well there's a quote at the end of uh, uh, letter seven that talks about this very thing Where's where he, um well it's on my page 77 no, but it's what's nowhere the, what, near what's the date of the letter uh, we're, we're kind of getting in. Why don't you what page? Read it? Yeah, I'm um, on chapter. Uh, in in letter number seven uh, from May fourteenth, nineteen o four, he says, "Someday there will be girls and women whose names will no longer mean the mere opposite of the male, but something in itself, something that makes one." Think not of any complement and limit, but only of life and reality, the female human being. So we're all the same. Yeah. And then he said, the kind of love will consist in this, the two solitudes protect and border and salute each other. So you're loving each other, but you still have that solitude. And there's and one specific female characteristic that distinguishes them from men and gives them a leg up, and that is that they have life, that they can carry life with yes, them. Yes, the yeah. motherhood. And that's the thing. He stresses right. I, motherhood. I thought he said, I, it's, yeah. what you said, but a little different, in yeah. that 
that males have a little, should have a little bit of feminine aspect to them, and females should have a little bit of the male, male aspect. aspect to them. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's what I was saying. I yeah. thought that he said right. that sometimes, and other times. He right. said men experience motherhood with their creativity. Right. Oh. Right. Because he, he was doing pages on comparing sex to creativity. He talks about the pain and pleasure of sex. Tell and me the about pain. pain. I want some suffering here. <laughs> 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 What's the pain of sex? That he's talking about. I think the pain about. of love. The pain of love. Because he said uh, love was no, very difficult. No, I think he says the pain of sex. Yeah. No, I didn't read it, but yeah. maybe so. Well, well okay. in the last minute or so, is there any other portion that we haven't talked about that really grabbed you? I mean, there's so oh, there's so, 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 so much. Well, so I, I, stopped, I stopped underlining. Yeah. After like the third <laughs> letter, because I thought the whole thing's going to be underlined. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> so many, so many wonderful. Uh, his his way with words is beautiful. I liked his summation that I actually wrote as a birthday wish for my daughter. The wish that you may find patience enough in yourself to endure, and simplicity enough to believe that you may acquire more and more confidence in that which is difficult, and in your solitude among others. And for the rest, let life happen to you. Believe me, life is right. In yes, 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 that's 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 great. I, I, I did have to say because you had mentioned in the uh, in your email what you were going to talk about um, in terms of depression and how that and as I was reading this um, as I said there were so many wonderful things but then I thought about the people who are crushed by life I mean where do they fit in do, do, does he have anything to say to them I mean these you know people who are crushed by their depression they don't learn from it they they kill themselves mm -hmm. you know other people who uh, right. you know, basically that that this uh, that sometimes the idea that, that life and its experiences enrich you, no, sometimes life and its experiences crush you. Yes. And, that's, uh, and that was something that I was hoping that he would say a little bit more about for the, but, for the rest of us. Right, right. <laughs> for the rest of us. But he was writing to one person. He was writing was, to one person. Who did get depressed, but not the kind of evidently. clinical press, yeah, but that depression one, yeah. you're talking about, which is yeah. for, we're very different. So, yeah. okay. I hope you enjoyed the show. As Aristotle said, the best way to learn is to get together in small groups and discuss great ideas.